um, you know, are trying to help care for them. But for Joseph Smith, once he arrives, his conclusion is that he very much wants to be able to find a place that he could build a city that would be a light unto the world. And, uh, and so with that, uh, several of the saints said, no, let's, uh, let's not stay together. Let's go all over the place. But he needs to have the saints be together because they all need to build a what? Temple. Every time the saints are gathered, we are very temple-building people. So, uh, you know, so the question is, where will we go, especially when we have no money for a down payment and we need lots of land for thousands and thousands of people? Now, in the United States, they did have cheap land, and we continue to have cheap land today. You'd say you can find it under the ocean. <laughs> Such a deal I have for you. You know, uh, you can find it out in the middle of the desert. Uh, you can find it in swamp lands. And swamp lands means that uh, part of the year, you know, kind of walking through it, you know, your part in water is the river then goes over its bounds and, okay. So the kind of land that Joseph will be able to acquire for literally no money down and part of the land, uh, he has not only no money down, but 20 years to the first payment. You know how you see some ads over here, buy your furniture, don't pay anything for one year. Uh, try and imagine, uh, tell me, was the realtor and the owner desperate when he says, uh, you know, uh, 20 years till the first payment, what would you say? Okay, absolutely. Now, we're going to talk about the land then that Joseph Smith uh, will acquire. Uh, the land, okay, is a peninsula that juts out in the Mississippi River. So you've got, here's your river, here's your land over here, but when you say a peninsula, it means it kind of juts out like this. Uh, okay, this land... To give you an idea of how poor the land was, there was a time in the United States where there was a great deal of prejudice, especially against the American Indian and against uh, African Americans. And so uh, they used to have, like as remember, they're moving the Indians west. Well, as they move the Indians west, invariably, quote, a white settler will fall in love with an Indian maiden. And suddenly they have children. So the question is, where, uh, you know, where can they stay? Where can they raise their children? Because, quote, part is white, part is, uh, you know, this uh, Native American Indian. And so the government in each state set apart land that was called, quote, half-breed land, meaning that this, uh, the parents were one race, and uh, another race. And as a result, where would we let them stay? Half-breed land. Tell me, is half-breed land the best land? Okay, no, in other words, it's viewed as this is the worst land in the state. So what was originally uh, Nauvoo was known as, quote, half-breed land. In other words, you know, it's a swamp land. We really want everybody who doesn't look like us to move west but we will set aside land for half-breeds. Well, coming to that area, who will purchase from the, quote, half-breeds, is a man whose name is James White, and obviously matched his skin color. <laughs> okay, so here comes James White. And his conclusion is, I want to purchase half-breed land. He actually purchases the land for uh, ears of corn. In other words, uh, for corn, he now buys half-breed land, and he changes the name to Venus. Okay, so what was Nauvoo then originally known? It's known as half-breed, and it's also known as something called Venus. Okay, who is Venus in mythology? Okay, she's a goddess of love. And uh, so you realize, if you name your land, after an amazing goddess of love, the man can think that, oh, there's amazing looking women in this town. So all of a sudden, you get, uh, remember, they're pressing against the frontier. So always to go west will be the man. And if he likes the town, 
He then comes back and he gets his wife and sweetheart and actually sometimes they're one and the same. So, okay, suddenly here comes now these kind of single men to Venus. And all of a sudden when they get out there, it's a swampland. What's the illness you get in a swampland? Malaria. And notice if you took apart the word malaria means what? Pablo, malaria. Okay, bad air. And so you know what these settlers thought, and you realize they're not that smart, but they actually thought if they built two-story houses and they lived up on the second story, they could get above the malaria, you know, the bad air, the, you know, swamps do smell, and therefore they wouldn't have the illness. What would you say? What carries malaria? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. And so is it going to work? It doesn't matter how high you build your building, they are still sick. Finally, uh, men, they are so sick, and you, you know, they didn't know what they had back then. So they'd say, oh, we have this strange fever. We have lung fever. We have all of these things. And finally, they're starting to say, we're going to abandon this uh, Venus. It doesn't work. And uh, even James White, uh, this first settler, has died. Coming into the area, then, will be people known as land speculators. Today, we call them <coughs> land developers. Uh, we call them realtors. You know, we give them a much more uh, ennobled title. But as these land uh, developers come in, they see, hey, here's a city, and it has two-story houses. You know what let's do? Let's change the name <coughs> of Venus to Commerce. Now, uh, Commerce, <laughs> the plan was, Commerce is like a paper city, meaning it's no more than Venus, but they just drew it out on a, on a piece of paper so you would think it was a big city. They drew in, you know, docks, ports. They put trees in town. They put streets in town. Well, that's pretty easy to do on a piece of paper. And uh, suddenly they, they had this piece of paper, and their conclusion was they were going to go east to the state of Connecticut. Back then, uh, everybody that was rich, uh, where did they typically want to live? And it was Connecticut. Having been to Connecticut, I'm pretty convinced the rich guys are still there. But nevertheless, the plan was, we call it commerce, we head to Connecticut, we tell the rich guys in Connecticut, come buy land in commerce. And I uh, know you don't have to see it. And they started saying that commerce would soon be bigger than New Orleans and that you want to be the first to be able to get in and buy. Tell me, was that smart? You know, it's pretty smart when the guy can't see it was once this, you know, and it still is a swampland. Well, they work their way out to Connecticut, and, you know, people in Connecticut start getting excited. We want to be able to buy out there on the Mississippi, but suddenly it's the year 1837. What happens in 1837? Okay, the banks fall. Okay, good. And as the banks fall, suddenly the people in Connecticut are saying, this isn't my year to invest. In other words, um, this is my year to try and hold on what I can see here in Connecticut. I cannot put money way out there by the Mississippi River. So land speculators come back, and as they come back, uh, suddenly they, they want to unload it. So much do they want to get rid of this land, they're now saying, hey, at least part of it, okay, come on this land and 20 years till at least first interest payment. Who is desperate enough to say, we'll take it and we'll build a city that will be a light unto the world? Okay, Joseph Smith, the Mormons, you know, who are just coming off of the extermination order. So about 50 miles above Quincy, now you're moving north, they move to Commerce. But as they move to Commerce, uh, tell me, are they going to get sick too? And you'd say, what's commerce like for the Latter-day Saints? Death and dying. And uh, you'd say it's constant funerals. In fact, what was the best business in town? And it was the guy that made coffins. Because uh, the coffin maker, he would actually advertise. 
at the old, um, well, it was now the Commerce Post Office, to come and get yourself measured for your coffin. Because when you die, we may not have one that fits you. So come in advance, get yourself measured, and then when you build your log cabin, today where you'd say you have a table by, you know, a chair or something, you'd say, oh, that's dad's coffin. Okay, and here is mom's coffin, and here, oh, here's Johnny and Susie's on the side. Well, okay. For Joseph Smith, there was so much death and dying in commerce for he and his people. You, you get some of the saints will now write in their journals. They will say, I would rather be in Missouri and face guns and swords than I would be to be in commerce. I am sick. Um, they're crawling. Uh, nobody's getting people, you know, water because everybody's ill. There was so much death and dying that Joseph finally said, you know, we can't uh, build this city if every day we're at funerals. You know how a funeral will stop a ward. And suddenly, you know, the Relay Society, they've got to do the food. You know, everybody's helping. And, you know, the whole, I mean, it's, you know, it's huge. It's a sorrow. And Joseph finally said, let's hold funerals just two days a week. Now, it's interesting, the two days that he selected. He selected Thursday and Monday. The reason for those two days was that <coughs> Thursday was a traditional day when Moses climbed Mount Sinai to commune with God. And Monday was a traditional day where he comes down with the big Ten Commandments. So you'd say, what's Joseph thinking in commerce? And I'd say, he knows a lot of Hebrew now. He knows a lot about the Bible. And his conclusion was, let's stop, <laughs> let's stop the town on Monday and Thursday. And everybody comes to the funerals. And at uh, every funeral, who's your main speaker? Who would you say? Joseph. So at those funerals, what does Joseph introduce? And you'd say, what he begins to introduce what we know today as temple work. So where was baptism introduced? I'd say, oh, commerce. Joseph's at a funeral. So you'd say, baptism's for the dead, okay? Joseph's at a funeral. It's in commerce. And he introduces baptisms for the dead. Now, uh, okay, how do you get the name? So notice, this one piece of land has been known as, what's the first name? Half breed. Okay. Great deal of prejudice. Half breed. What's the next name? Venus. Venus. Oh, well, she's gorgeous. You know, come to Venus. The next is known as commerce. And how does it get the name Nauvoo? It's because Joseph <coughs> begins to see people who begin to, uh, well, you'd say, here's Joseph Smith. He's standing out in the water. Here's a line of people lining up to go out to have Joseph baptize them for their son, their mother, their aunt, their uncle. Uh, one man, well, back then, people used to know their uh, family history. And one man actually did uh, baptisms for 32 generations of ancestors. And then you'd say about 100 yards from him, here's Brigham, and here's people lining up. And then 100 yards, here's Farley, and then here's Wilford, and they would just kind of wrap around this land called Commerce. One day, as Joseph is walking the streets, and he sees the baptismal work going on, he stops and he said, I'm going to Nate, give this town a new name, and the new name he gives it is Nabu, which is a Hebrew word. Remember, you know, uh, you know Moses, okay. And now baptism is for the dead. He said, I'm going to call it Nabu, which means a beautiful situation. And Nabu will become this light unto the world. Now, uh, Nabu, I think, is spectacular today. But okay. So Joseph then changes the name of the town to Nabu. A Hebrew word meaning a beautiful <coughs> situation. Okay, so here's Nabu. And you'd say, well, Joseph was alive. The saints are in Nauvoo from 1839 until 1844. And Joseph dies June 27, 1844. And it was known as Nauvoo. 
But when Joseph dies, what did Nauvoo look like? Well, the Nauvoo Temple was about a story and a half high, but it was like a shell of a building. It didn't have rooms inside, no flooring, and you'd say it's that. Uh, you'd say, well, what about the Nauvoo House, spoken in section 124? About the same thing. You know, bricks have gone up, but there's no roof, there's no windows in, and you'd say uh, there were a few brick houses, but as Brigham Young, uh, who's now leading the church, Brigham Young was a builder. And uh, you'd say, as Brigham Young now looks over the town, most people are still living in log cabins and kind of, um, you know, board houses.